chapter one of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter one women first class kemble h girton equal to six second class none the reference was to the classical tripos at cambridge and those pleasant words crowned miss honora kemble's very satisfactory career at the university she read the list on the senate house door with the most vivid sense of delight she had ever experienced in an age when women are winners all round she saw herself as one predestined to be the particular favourite of fortune every tower and pinnacle was glorified in the triumph of the moment but miss kemble's head was a strong one and walking rather deliberately with a self-collected air she carried her honours with admirable nerve and composure all the way down the high street very few university folk remained and of these the aspect was jaded and worn amongst them were a few girl students who were out on the same errand as herself three stood laughing and chattering on the pavement near king's noonham said honora to herself as she passed the group with a majestic air that is miss kemble of girton her coach told me she would have had a higher place in the first only it has been such a very good year you know what a woman she is she looks simply splendid the words were quite audible and reached miss kemble's ear many such phrases distributed over many terms from small adoring students had gradually shaped in her imagination a very beautiful and complete creature honora turned into queen's that was her favourite college she passed erasmus's tower and came to the rustic bridge the silence of a hot summer's day reigned the river was too still to disturb the ear with the smallest ripple every leaf and twig slumbered and the only movement was the stealing of light in and out between the shades it was an hour and a moment favourable to the deep historic sense of things and it arrested honora a sigh of delight escaped her and with it some of her well-guarded elation she paused resting her hand upon the bridge and looking towards the buildings everybody said and by everybody all girton is meant that miss kemble's ideas were remarkable and that she was never known to utter a commonplace word if erasmus could see me now she thought if stepping through that archway in his long doctor's cloak and with his bent dreamy head and thin sarcastic lips he looked up and found me here and raised a rebuking finger and questioned me as to my right how wonderfully i could answer him even erasmus could not have foretold me men are as god made them neither better nor worse nor much changed from the beginning progress is with us the women of my century are not the women of his you can measure time by its women and here on this bridge i honora kemble just a nineteenth-century woman no more can stand fearlessly ready to confront erasmus or anybody face to face she leaned over the bridge and looked smilingly down into the sluggish peaceful river it has been slow but it is here she murmured in the foremost ranks of time that is a splendid feeling i am a woman only a woman they used to say and i am behind no one i am abreast of the foremost a knowledge of genuine acquirement furnished a substantial basis for her pleasant self-congratulation she was amongst the first half-dozen classics for the year only five men had beaten her whereas she had beaten three or four times that number from the university point of view that was indeed to take precedence in the world whereupon her mind was hurried away by all sorts of visions in every one of which she saw herself moving as the happy victor of circumstance but a memory strong and vivid from the prose world of every day suddenly dispersed this dreaming she looked up rather abruptly and turned again towards the arch in presence of this new thought her hand dropped from the bridge and she stood upright with an 
alert happy expression in her eyes the phantom of erasmus had disappeared it was still only in imagination but coming through the arch the eye of her mind beheld the figure of a man of middle height and square set form wearing the modern academic cap and gown and advancing towards her with a kind smile of congratulation it was in imagination merely but it was clear and vivid it led her to seek over the old building for one particular pair of windows upon which when they were discovered her eyes rested those used to be mr littleton's rooms she said to herself i wonder who has them now a year passed away honora left the university and returned home her home was a rectory in one of the most northern of the midland counties to the end everything in her career at college had been as it should be and every one was satisfied with her and with it indeed she carried a kind of glory away with her and left a reputation behind amongst the younger and lesser girton students it had always been the fashion to adore her to win a word or a nod from miss kemble raised the self-respect of the more timid aspirants to education this courageous and successful young woman who marched straight forward and captured the citadel whatever it might be was in herself an earnest of things to come she had done credit to her sex and her sex was proud of her reflected rays were cast around and all the little students basked in them and thought of the greatness of woman then too the lecturers tutors and professors had all of them been cordial and respectful in their bearing to honora honora had seized on the advantages comprehended in an all-round education and had not concentrated herself too entirely upon classics she had dipped into a good many things and was able to talk easily and brightly upon many topics that made her a very pleasant companion and her straightforward direct manner was an additional charm everything in the academic time had been a cheery preparation for an easy and prosperous career through life and now the preparation was over and the enterprise had begun the rectory lay in a land that gradually sloped off from a wild and hilly district to a fruitful and pastoral plain honora had returned only to-day and stood in the evening hour alone looking round the room that was to be her own her finger was laid thoughtfully on her lips and she was eyeing things with critical and re reconstructive glances for her habitual consciousness was of culture and just now she felt a want of harmony between herself and the homely surroundings of her bedroom it was a long low pleasant room with two wide casement windows having broad old-fashioned window seats creepers grew outside across one lower pane lay a branch of the gloire de dijon heavy with roses that is very pretty said honora i shall leave the rose tree as it is the windows were wide open and the twitter of birds the far-off lowing of cattle and the distant voices of children came in with the scent of flowers and a warm june sunlight honora began to move gently about the wide and sunny place putting it to rights first she occupied herself with two large cases of college books in her hand was a dust brush and as she lifted a book from the case she dusted it before placing it on the shelf the room was well furnished throughout but with strict and old-fashioned simplicity upon the walls were no pictures save one over the mantelpiece there in a wooden frame hung an illuminated text done in stiff letters in fading colours and with imperfect execution the illumination had hung there ever since honora could remember it was the handiwork of her dead mother and she believed that it had been placed there by her own hands honora never dreamed of taking it down the words of the text were as follows be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding every now and then as she dusted and arranged her book she turned her head and looked at the text with a frown honora was certainly handsome she was of good height and slim and she had a quantity of rippling hair of a pleasant brown colour which she wore loosely twisted in a knot on the crown of her head her features were good and her eyebrows well marked beneath them were a good enough pair of brown eyes but they were wanting in warm sensitive shadows and were singularly unhistorical 
that which gave the face real beauty was the clever brow and the living health of the complexion besides which she had a particularly pleasant mouth the upper lip ran upwards in the centre with a very pretty curve and a fullness as though some bee had stung it and the shortness of the lip caused her to show her teeth prettily every time she spoke a beautiful mouth is a great gift to women the last thing that honora took out of the case was a small box containing a few things that were either breakable or were particularly treasured she unlocked it lying at the top was the framed cabinet portrait of a man she lifted it out dusted it and then holding it before her in her rather large capable hands looked again at the mantelpiece and at the inscription which bade her not to resemble the mule i really cannot place leslie littleton under that text said she where shall i put him she glanced round the room then back to the mantel-shelf and held out the picture as though trying to see whether by any chance the incompatible could become compatible finally she decided that nothing could bring the horse and the mule into line with certain distinguished memories connected with the man whom the portrait represented the most suitable position was the bureau and she placed it amongst the pens and ink and the sheets of paper which she intended to cover with her clever handwriting and after that the arrangement of the pleasant bedroom was complete and she walked to the window it was dull at present dull in the out-of-the-way country rectory but life drew after her as naturally as seas after a moon and it could not be long before even here she surrounded herself by a circle and turned existence into a prolonged and exquisite perambulation through a greek garden beauty and philosophy following in her steps i shall rise early said she and read greek before breakfast that will keep me up for the day it is the greek spirit i wish to cultivate the clock struck and she started from her dream it was time to go downstairs honora's taste was formed upon the latest aesthetic model but the adornment of the rectory from attic to cellar was solid old-fashioned and puritanic as she peeped into one room after another on her way downstairs she silently concluded that her parents in their youth had preferred things ugly she determined to run up to london to procure a few art things for being sole mistress now there was no reason why the upholstery and furniture should not be gradually revolutionized to suit her taste the drawing-room caused her some very unpleasant surmises and when she reached it she paused at the door looking round with a face of dismay it had been stationary since its first furnishing no hand having modified or improved a thing the curtains and chair covers were green undoubtedly green of course she had seen it a thousand times before but her absences from home had been prolonged and to-day the crude colour mounted as a fume to the brain whose visual sense had been carefully developed and cultivated honora made a horrified grimace she closed her lids and pressed her little bit of a cambric handkerchief against them je suis tombé en verre she exclaimed aloud with a little laugh the problem before her was undoubtedly a tough one the table was a heavy handsome machine exactly pitched in the centre of the floor so it had stood for thirty years at least this rigidity was depressing honora glancing round the room found everything to match no one had made the least effort to bring the place into line with the prevailing idea of beauty as she swept into the room pausing beside the centre-table to look at the books and to drop them impatiently she was as conscious of discrepancy between herself and her surroundings as she would have been had the young charmides entered in person charmides was a kind of ideal to honora of course matters could be brought a little more into accord with her taste by degrees but it was disheartening to discover that everything was hideous and that so much had to be done she must impress her own personality upon the house and freshen it up from attic to cellar she liked things brand new just as she liked her ideas new that is in the sense of being the latest craze by such little things was indicated the proper savoir-faire and savoir-vivre 
she had a momentary feeling of being surrounded by decay and passing to the window she stood there gazing out with damped spirits i wonder when i shall see or hear from leslie littleton again said she in unwonted depression the world seemed very far away she thought of it for a moment as a departing tide but only for a moment her self-sufficiency was superb with sudden alacrity she turned away and passed out of the room and down the passage to her father's study where she knocked at the door come in said a rather tremulous old voice of great sweetness and tone honora opened the door and stood on the threshold without advancing her father was seated at a table covered with books some papers lay beside him but the sheets were blank and he did not appear to have been writing she saw an open bible and one or two volumes upon theology the study was rather dimly lighted by a single square window and was sparely furnished saving that one side of it from floor to ceiling was entirely covered by books over the mantelpiece were two pencil sketches of oriel college oxford and of st mary's church of that university the dates beneath were in the forties the glance which he turned to honora upon her entrance made her wonder for the moment whether he really saw her so hazy was it with visions of its own he was a venerable-looking man not tall and somewhat spare in figure with a thin fine face and white hair the eyes were of a light colour and were short-sighted the liquidity of youth had not so much passed away from them as is common in advanced age they were full of expression they had the saintly look as though the doors of the kingdom had been opened to him and he had retained within them some ray from that glory his figure was not that of a weak man and if his shoulders stooped a little it was but the habit of the lonely scholar with all his learning and honora always thought of this as being of an archaic quality he was very human and when an apprehension of the brilliant figure in the doorway took possession of him all the father within him expanded and the mundane and secular returned he remembered his horace dulce redentum la lagem amabo dulce loquentum said he yes nebula malusque jupiter urget will do very nicely to describe the atmosphere of your study with all these terrible old books replied honora promptly when her father began the quotation she smiled in grateful surprise the answering pride on his face as she capped it relieved the sense of gloom under which her spirits had sunk in the green drawing-room and shaking her head back with a bright look she came on from the doorway her father found her aspect very sparkling and fine she carried all this brilliancy right to the old horsehair sofa and sat down dear father i hope my home-coming will be a comfort to you said she carissima he responded in a low quiet voice slowly and with an indescribably significant movement passing his fine old hand over the open pages of the bible honora felt touched she knew not why she recalled almost with self-reproach that she intended to revolutionize the furniture and though she had no idea of relinquishing her design she hoped very much that he would not mind and registered a vow to be considerate and defer to him wherever it was possible when a few moments afterwards the servant announced supper and with old-fashioned grace he rose and opened the door for her and signed that she should precede him she felt that she should never have to be ashamed of him even if a greater than leslie littleton came to visit her for was he not a scholar and a gentleman the advent of leslie littleton was nearer than she supposed as she sat opposite to her father at that miscellaneous evening meal which forced forced her to regret dinner in hall he cleared his throat and began a new topic my dear you remember mr littleton honora sat suddenly upright she had been drooping back in her chair and crumbling the bread yes of course she added emphatically after an infinitesimal pause i received a letter of very kind congratulation from him this morning said the rector congratulation honora upon your attainments and success why did not mr littleton write to me father asked honora in surprise the old rector wore a diffident air are you such great friends honora said he 
why of course the rector looked up slowly and encountered her eyes two points of unblinking light they startled him a little a faint wistful perplexity dimmed his own he had such an unfathomable reverence for the mysteries of a woman's heart and nature he says he is coming to see us in a day or two he continued does he cried honora she sat more upright still her eyes sparkled more you are glad honora said the rector with the utmost gentleness oh very rippled out her clear tones there are matters in which mr littleton can help me i need advice in my reading there are all sorts of modern books the very newest to which he can direct me all was not finished she continued smiling across the table with my college career and my degree i mean to do some literary work original work father mr littleton can help me he will be most useful ah the rector had a certain deep and tender reticence into which he now dropped all his fatherly surmises he continued his meal in a silence which was unbroken by honora save that once she looked up from her busy thoughts and rather shyly put the following question do you think that while mr littleton is here you would object to our having late dinner instead of supper do as you like my dear responded the rector in immediate concession after supper followed in the order of domestic rule family prayers the table being cleared before honora had made any attempt to adjourn to the green drawing-room the servant placed a bible and church prayer-book before the rector honora had forgotten all about family prayers there was some hesitation in her manner and additional colour in her cheek as she unwillingly seated herself upon the sofa the college curriculum and the dipping into everything which had accompanied it had gradually and insensibly purged from her heart and intellect any belief in religious dogma mr littleton's influence had perhaps been paramount in this matter real pain and an honourable tumult troubled her as she prepared to take her unreal part in the ceremony the rector in utter unconsciousness of her thoughts opened the bible and drew a candle near to aid his sight he held it close to him with one hand and it flickered disagreeably while he sat with his hooked nose and short-sighted eyes peering into the page the circumstance affected honora again with a sense of dreariness besides that more excruciating question in casuistry her father's reading was slow and by and by his voice lulled her restless thoughts and even excluded her attention her mind departed to other matters and when the servants knelt down she followed the same order automatically it had been an old dream of hers to undertake the study necessary for a work upon greek vases it was to be a minute examination of the progressive art of greece its civilization myths and manners as the ornamentation of pictures upon vases illustrated it while her father's reverential voice read over the collects for the day she was entirely absorbed in an imaginary conversation with mr littleton in which she confided to him the projected form and scope of the work suddenly however something arrested her attention words that were unfamiliar fell upon her ear those sentences were not in the prayer-book and the tone in which they were pronounced trembled exceedingly she left off thinking about greek vases and listened against her will and this was what she heard hearing with surprise but without understanding thou that searchest the heart as with a candle make clear to me also my ignorance and my error that i who have prescribed thy commandment unto others betray not in my own person the good and just charity delivered unto us that i thy appointed overseer in righteousness forget not to be an imitator of christ's endurance nor set my head high where his lay low prevent me that i fall not into the sin of covetousness with ananias and with that valens whom by the mouth of thy servant polycarp thou didst resist but that forsaking the vain doing of the many i may return unto the command which was delivered to us from the beginning from which let nothing visible or invisible move me meekly in my heart i receive thy judgment lord and as one who is beginning to learn for christ's sake 
amen there was a deep pause before the rector his voice still trembling exceedingly pronounced the benediction upon the small assembly then the servants rose and honora with them she seated herself again upon the sofa and being left alone with her father turned her eyes upon him questioningly wondering whether he expected her to remain or whether she might retire to her books she found that he was gazing at her with an expression not easily to be fathomed honora said he there was that in his tone which made her heart stand still in extraordinary apprehension End of chapter one chapter two of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter two honora sat more upright and looked at her father wonderingly it is well honora he began that now you have returned to me a beautiful and completed instrument i should make a confidence to you of the spiritual experience through which god has led me during the last few years of my life in mercy to my incapacity this surpassing revelation has come to me slowly you apprehend me my daughter yes father of course said honora who thought no nut too hard for her intellectual teeth to crack i am the more led to speak with you now and openly that i recall with extraordinary vividness my own return from that alma mater whose memory i cherish to the day of my death little did i dream honora when god gave me a daughter instead of the desired son and then took my beloved wife your mother from me that he gave me the two gifts in one and that i should live to see a day like this for in my youth and middle age the estate of woman was not as now honora smiled vera incessu patuit dea continued the rector and we who were young then knew not of this appearance upon our earth of a woman transformed in so far as being mentally equipped as man and yet retaining her inimitable tenderness and grace that is also a great gift and to me a special mercy shall i record my experiences my daughter pray do father said honora with a somewhat shrinking manner it was continued the rector at the university that my own spiritual birth took place and therefore your return from the university seems a fitting occasion for this confidence i had indeed a mind already consecrated to the service of god and his church but it was under the influence of the wonderful reawakening of spirituality in the church which has been described as the tractarian movement that the true significance of my own vocation came to me he paused for a moment honora was looking at him with mingled distrust and perplexity it was as though something droned on in a dream and disturbed her thinking with a vague vexation the rector's eyes were fixed on some heavenly horizon of his own and he remarked nothing of her demeanour i know little honora he continued presently of the state of religious feeling in cambridge at the present day from your university sprang the evangelical and broad church movements concerning these it is not mine to judge yet i have sorrowed over this as being something which delays the perfect unity of the church and it was said by st ignatius that should any go after him who makes a schism in the church he shall not inherit the kingdom of god i would hope honora that your following is not of the broad or evangelical movement the rector's voice trembled a little and he looked at his daughter in a suspense tempered by charity neither movement said honora shortly then you will the better understand how that marvellous revival of the early christian life in our dying church affected my young mind 
i suppose i can said honora whose heart began to sicken you will apprehend how that realization of immediate spiritual descent from the first founders and bishops and if i may in great meekness and reverence touch on that great truth from the very christ himself by the laying on of hands laid hold of my life and how i beheld our mundane existence as a perpetual sacramental service in which not i alone and those with me who were of the same mind should join but nature itself in its harmonious obedience to the single law of god as was said by st clement the heavens moving by his appointment are subject to him in peace day and night accomplish the courses that he has allotted them not disturbing one another so that as his minister i sought carefully day by day lest i should miss his steps and fail of his command yet honora such is the blindness even of eyes that seek for the light that i now know i have been failing during years to understand the still small voice of his guidance he lifted his hand and there was a look on his face as though the solemn surprise of some strange revelation still haunted him honora shuddered she knew not why all about and around her young self-assured life something was flowing that was dark to her foreign now listen continued her father to what befell me six years ago especially did i fear lest i should lose for him one of those sheep over whom he had appointed me shepherd and it happened that searching my parish books to see if any of my flock were neglected of me i came to a name known to me only by repute and that a tarnished one the name was piers norbury i know whom you mean said honora glad to touch something of earth again the old chartist weaver and poacher a disreputable man and yet said the rector rather quickly the instrument appointed by god to confound me as i read the name i remembered that i had never called upon the man having shrunk from my duty to one who was notorious in his contempt for the church and whom i knew not whether to describe as dissenter or atheist that same evening i went out to visit him you know the cottage honora it lies in the wildest part of the country amongst the hills but i reached the place before sunset and knocked the door was open and i saw an old man of a reverend appearance seated at a table reading and i knew that the book was the bible the lord said i has passed before me on the way at that moment he looked up and without speaking fixed his eyes upon me in such a manner that i found myself confused and the words i had prepared died on my lips they were very lonely eyes honora i knew the look for i myself have experienced the loneliness of life and the filling of that loneliness with things supernatural seeing my hesitation he gravely invited me in and this without moving and keeping his horny hands folded on the open page of the bible the impression of god in man had never before so overcome me peers i said let us read in that book together i he said you who call yourself a minister of christ read in this page before me he turned the bible pointing with his hand a sunbeam red with evening fell through the dusty window and lay upon the page and upon his rugged finger a mist was before my eyes and i searched for my glasses i remembered how christ had said where two or three are gathered together there am i in the midst and i knew that he was with us then i got my glasses and silently read where the old chart is pointed and they were the very words of christ himself woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye devour widows houses do not ye after their works for they say and do not for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers such were the lines towards which his finger moved often and often had i read these words but now they shook me again he paused and this time a very deep sigh escaped him all this is the merest mysticism 
thought honora to herself she was careful to keep silent because that seemed the better part of discretion by no means prepared to acquaint her father with the absolute divergence of their opinions she was simply afraid that argument about details would prolong the ordeal her eyes were fixed wearily upon him and so far her uppermost thought was that the time she might have devoted to work preparatory to mr littleton's visit was slipping away you have heard of the chartist movement honora said the rector presently of course yes said honora glad of anything as familiar as the testing of her knowledge norbury had been a chartist when young he was in the very heart of the movement he knew o'brien cooper and other of the leaders he had heard the demagogues fergus o'connor stevens and so on speak at one time his own name was well known in the villages and regularly mentioned in the northern star they were all demagogues i suppose said honora lifting her hand to pat one side of her hair not so returned mr kemble gently there were distinctions between men here as elsewhere the enthusiasm was real which procured such faithful adherence i found that norbury for instance still lived in the movement and the movement in him the chartist movement said honora vaguely i thought it was all over ages ago long before i was born nothing that has the seed of truth in it dies ever at the time of the agitation norbury was a young man but i repeat it is not dead in him indeed said honora there were words some of them coarse enough in their ruthless truth which had been burnt into his heart in those early fervid moments of his youth and from them the fire had not yet escaped some of them terrible words to me he repeated he repeated coarse words to you cried honora indignantly just so said the rector calmly who has exempted us from the buffets of truth the face of our lord was submitted to the buffeting of falsehood and shall we refuse those of truth you remember fergus o'connor honora faintly coloured the chartist movement was represented in her mind by half a page of history and the demagogues who led it were undistinguished one from another my education has been classical said she in reproachful reference to her honours ah returned the rector absently o'connor was a man upon whom norbury once pinned his faith what pathos resembles that of these shepherdless sheep in search of a true shepherd it was o'connor who in one of his popular speeches made use of the remark that he supposed the rich parsons who uttered the words of the beautiful collect preserved to our use the kindly fruits of the earth gave the editorial meaning to the pronoun and in their hearts signified by the petition preserved to my use this o'connor was a vulgar person i presume said honora it is a bitter thing my daughter said the rector now looking gravely into her eyes when truth reaches us in a coarse jest honora made an inquiring movement of the head she was puzzled but the solemn earnestness of her father's manner kept alive that beat of apprehension with which the interview had opened father she cried at last seeing that he awaited some response what can the words and opinions of a disreputable person have to do with you and me the methods of god have often been in strange disguises returned the rector i recall that the spiritual revival of the church named the tractarian movement had been simultaneous in time with this movement of the people at the very moment when my spirit bathed itself most in the inspirations of the one the other was not far from me i myself even then felt the stirring of that other passing wing once at the season of the so-called riots i was present at the passing of a crowd of the workers and when i saw those stricken faces those weary eyes and stern accusing brows which yet were exalted by resolve and hope as one sees the eyes of the diseased and dying lit up by spiritual and eternal hope i was shaken and troubled and my conscience was uneasy as though i it might be were guilty in the matter mindful of this feeling i asked of my god what have i to do with these but silence followed on my question and it may be i forgot that i had asked it yet the answers of god wait long 
the rector paused honora waited also in suspense and alarm honora he began again solemnly why did the tractarian movement after the extraordinary outpouring of the spirit which marked it in the beginning seem to go under and fail in the end how can i tell replied honora almost sharply was it not continued the rector because it divorced itself from that other movement it may be so said honora who can acquit the church of sin in this matter of the sins of covetousness and blood guiltiness of other care they little reckoning make than how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away the worthy bidden guest milton was not quite unprejudiced said honora just so he returned but the accusation is old what is new is to refer that accusation to one's self yet the church has never wholly forgotten the neglected vow of poverty the duty and fashion of poverty she herself has laid over and over again upon her ministers as one lays upon the consecrated a special garment poverty repeated honora her heart shrinking from the word as from the prick of a needle of poverty returned the rector firmly of poverty which our lord laid on us provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor scrip for your journey neither two coats neither shoes nor yet staves but i when i began my journey sought first for my living and coming here to be the shepherd of souls taxed without a question or remorse my luxury upon the poor and settled myself upon them as a burden to be kept not in that meat of which the workman is worthy but in repletion and display father what can you mean cried honora now in serious alarm have i not to remember my daughter that to the weary and the struggling and the heavy laden i have called not come but give he opened his hands and stretched them out and apart with the palms upwards he had forgotten honora and honora knew it she was listening now intently enough and that with terrified surmise she felt as one hurried along a dark place which narrows ever more swiftly and closely to an inevitable point it was a great sin said the rector under his breath you will understand honora that i went back to the neglected history of those early days and studied it in the light of the chartist movement i read the indictment which the people's charter brought against the receivers of rent and tithe i compared it with holy writ behold the hire of the labourers who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept down by fraud crieth two great facts struck to my heart of hearts during this study the church did nothing to further the efforts of the leaders of social reform and the leaders of social reform distrusted accused and opposed the church between the two burning inspirations of the day there was strife instead of cooperation the church has always had its enemies murmured honora in a low unquiet voice wondering what was driving her to defend an institution she despised enemies of the church were not alone the accusers the good and pious shaftesbury complains that out of sixteen thousand clergy at that time in england only fifty came forward to help him to redeem the children from the mines fifty only were mindful of his words who said feed my lambs shaftesbury tells us that the clergy were cowed by capital and power they betrayed christ to mammon i find none he says who cry aloud and spare not the rector leaned over the table covering his face with his hands deep silence fell within the room broken only by his heavy laboured breathing display of emotion was not common to him and demonstrativeness was foreign to honora she disliked it and rarely found herself touched by it she was not touched now her feeling was of simple fear and of horrible surmise when her father raised his face it was whiter than it had been father why didst thou form the flowers they blossom not for us or ours why didst thou clothe the fields with corn robbers from us our share have torn 
quoted the rector solemnly this time honora could put no title to the poem it struck her as shocking doggerel and she winced at hearing it from her father's lips lips that seemed adapted only to the classical and scholarly was his brain touched there was a collectedness in his manner and a clearness in his statements which forbade the idea he became more and more earnest yet never frantic he put his case with firm moderation there was deliberation and purpose in every sentence he spoke it was this that caused her to listen with something beyond the lenient respect which was her habitual attitude towards him what it was all leading up to she really could not at present conjecture but it was detestable to be met with something so mystical yes and dismaying on the first evening of her return home on the very threshold of her career she looked at the clock and then arranged the ribbon of her dress to which the artistic pocket holding her handkerchief was attached she passed her fingers over her eyebrows and smoothed them out so as to keep down a frown will you not understand honora he continued that once i discovered that a part of my life had gone unproved and uncontrolled i set myself to examine it hitherto that important part of existence the means by which i lived had not been assumed by me to be a part of personal duty i had practised the rule of asceticism and of personal humility but i had gone no further so far the law of my lord went here it had stopped the gathering of my tithes lay in the hands of my lawyer and agent i determined that i would look into my own responsibilities and would perform this task for myself it had become necessary for me to know whence i reaped my luxuries i went myself from farm to farm and found in many instances that the faces of my parishioners darkened at my appearance when i made inquiries stories of hardship were told me and signs of bitterness exhibited in occasional cases i found that the farmers ground the faces of the labourers and stole the tithe from wages it was coke who said the bread of the poor is the life of the poor and he who defraudeth them is a man of blood but father this was the tithe it was your right cried honora it was the tithe clement instructs us that in the eucharistic celebration not only the bread and wine but the tithes and first fruits had in the early church a definite place amid eucharistic offerings an offering you understand honora not to god's minister but to god himself such a thought illustrated to the point of anguish what i learned in my inquiries throughout the parish i had traced the consecrated offering to its source it had been spared by the sweat and suffering of the poor to be a gift to the lord and i had unhesitatingly consumed it on my own luxury dear father said honora in a frightened tone i am sure you have been ill i am sure you exaggerate no said the rector sorrowfully and quietly it was merely that my eyes were opened pascal again a later writer honora and one not of the authority of the fathers yet one deeply informed in spiritual truth shows us how god dwelt hidden beneath the veil of nature until the incarnation hiding himself again beneath the veil of humanity and returning to dwell with us now to the end in the mystic obscurity of the eucharistic elements the eucharistic elements which in the early church comprehensively included the tithes and first fruits it was in the light of that truth most solemnly borne in upon me in the moment that i recognized my sin that i reconsidered my position re-read the holy scriptures and formed my resolve he beckoned to her signing that she should seat herself by his side and she rose and did so unwillingly he turned the leaves of the bible calmly pointing out portions for her to read they were mainly prophetic denunciations such as he had quoted before he read aloud to her chosen passages from the fathers passages touching on the rule of life for the early christian more especially for the bishop or the servant of the flock there was no hurry neither was there fever in his manner a furtive glance from honora satisfied her upon this point and she did not know whether she were more alarmed or relieved by it the passages were simple direct and beyond the possibility of miscomprehension 
from a churchman's point of view they were conclusive when all was read he turned again towards his daughter do you follow me honora said he very gently the two looked into one another's eyes there was fear in her face pathos in his ah said he faintly turning away from her and leaning back in his chair father i do not in the least understand said honora almost querulously i had thought said the rector brokenly you would have followed me that it might be i should have won your encouragement and co-operation of course i understand what you have said returned honora but not what it leads up to she made the last remark in the desperate spirit of one who is assured that the worst is coming and would fain know what it is will it be too hard for you my child said the rector with an accent of self-reproach would that i could spare you honora spare me what cried the girl now with a real beat of anguish in her voice believe me carissima it is for your sake only i have hesitated had it not been for you i should have acted long since i besought the lord with prayers and tears to spare you my daughter my tenderly nurtured one and i could not find it in my heart to curtail the splendid expectation of your education or diminish your imagining of what your home return would be you find me in your home externally such as you would look for yes why of course exclaimed honora there was an intrusion of the image of the green drawing-room in her mind but at that moment she clung to it as to something precious upon which she had meditated an outrage but as i am now and as your home is now it will no longer be how is that father what is going to happen cried honora in a thin voice and with a shaft of fire in her heart for six years honora i have found it as impossible to touch the money that is called the tithe as i should find it to take for my own use the money from the offertory father what cried honora dizzily i shall never be able to touch the tithe again god's hand withholds me i have not i repeat touched it for six years but what does it mean it has not changed i was at college but home seemed the same during the last six years you and i honora have lived on my small capital lived on our capital exclaimed honora a burning blush demonstrating how practically the most elegant woman can appreciate the bearings of a money question just so the expenditure has for your sake been at the usual rate and the capital always small is diminished besides the little that is left there remains the income of one hundred and fifty pounds which i received as your mother's dowry it is mine until my death and afterwards yours i design honora what has become of the tithes of the church income of the living i mean interrupted honora in pale bewilderment i have laid that up in safety against the day when i shall know what is the lord's will concerning it the living is not gone asked honora pressing her tiny handkerchief against her lips the tithes are paid as before but not to me or for me said the rector honora caught at hope in this collapse of all those sheltering walls of dependent wealth here at least was firm footing left the living was still there there were whole years of income probably banked it had not been expended as the capital had it was not gone the thought allayed the wild tumult of anxiety which had made every vein and pulse in her body momentary centres of pain then her habitual equality to any kind of occasion steadied her she would not despair of altering her father's decision of combating this extraordinary phase by healthy reasonable methods and then she thought of leslie littleton and his approaching visit it was as though amongst troubled waters her feet had touched a rock i interrupted you said she turning to her father with a calmer look you were speaking of my mother's income i designed that for you honora said the rector in eager response to the softening of her manner i would not force upon you the poverty i designed for myself i shall content myself with the one hundred pounds of interest on our remaining capital this will cover all the expenses i intend to permit myself and will be ample repayment for the work i do i owe to my flock many years of superfluous luxury i must live sparely now the one hundred and fifty pounds which belong to your mother is yours 
one hundred and fifty honora's instant thought was of the utter inadequacy of the sum to the cost of that life which she had designed for herself and her father's income reduced to one hundred two hundred and fifty by which to carry on the rectory and maintain their position in the county it was enough perhaps for bare personal needs at a pinch but the frame the environment the setting what had become of the scheme of her years as she had sketched it she stared at her father blankly and when the wistful old eyes saw the hard uncomprehending look of fear and shock in the young face before him he winced and closed the bible and moved back his chair we will talk of this later on said he wearily retire now my child End of chapter two chapter three of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter three the meeting between father and daughter next morning was constrained there was no quarrel between the two of course but the rector was cruelly conscious of having inflicted a blow and honora's feeling of perplexity and injury was too deep for her to be able to keep all trace of it out of her manner besides she had passed an almost sleepless night to one thing she had made up her mind and that was to defer action until the arrival of mr littleton on whose assistance she counted and to avoid reference to the conversation of the evening before inaction seemed to her the most probable way of preventing a precipitation of matters when breakfast was finished and the rector glad that the discomforting meal was over had drawn back his chair and taken up the paper honora came hesitatingly forward and stood before him father said she he looked up his eyes were tender and even had a faint revival of expectation in them the kingdom of god was nearer to him than anything else and he believed in miracles in honora's cheek was a noticeable colour you remember that mr littleton is coming shortly said she littleton coming ah yes said he quickly you said began honora slowly and shyly last night at supper you know father you said we might have late dinner while mr littleton is here certainly my dear certainly he replied she thanked him and turned away he followed the graceful undulating figure with his eyes which were very wistful while he pondered over that sad experience when the disparity of sex is felt not as an attraction or particular tenderness but as sheer separation there was nothing special for honora to do that morning and a ramble in the open air seemed the only relief possible to her state of mind it was not easy to study greek myths with an avalanche hanging over her she longed to be walking vigorously over the hills and by sheer activity to shake off some of the discomposure that was so new and hateful to her the morning favoured her it had rained in the night and the air was fresh and clear and the sun not too hot honora turned unconsciously into the very path her father had taken six years ago on his fateful visit to piers norbury it lay over a bare stretch of woodland glorified by heather only here and there and for the most part covered with a thin colourless hair-like grass the road was rough and bare on either side were broken walls of blackish stone unsoftened by the tracing of lichen or the soft colours of moss here and there dotted amongst the hills were bare-looking cottages substantially built of stone and having a long upper chamber of which the windows for the most part were closed by masonry 
honora knew all about it those had been the weavers cottages when the weaving of cotton cloth was a home industry and the long rooms were for the hand looms the windows had been closed up to escape the window tax when the industry began to fade some of the old weavers lingered still within her father's parish men who now earned their living in fashions more precarious than other parishioners and who were not unsuspected of poaching they were in honora's mind at least of a somewhat riotous reputation as having been concerned in the chartism of the forties from another point of view they lent she thought some distinction to the place as being of historical interest until last night she had classed them with other archaeological reminiscences of the neighbourhood with the reputed passage of the pretender and his army along this very road a tradition which she was fond of saying in her accurate manner was not quite authenticated but the lumbering of the pretender's train over the rugged way and the enthusiasm of the chartists had hitherto appeared to her as events of about equal interest and importance both being historically as dead as last year's leaves upon reaching the highest point of the hill she paused out of breath and leaned against the wall a red weasel in shy frightened hurry darted across the road and vanished through an aperture in the stones when that tiny rustle was over the stillness was complete even the birds flew too high to break it with the sound of their wings though their shadows flitted across the sunlit road continually honora relieved by the exercise and with the glow of it upon her permitted her mind to run backwards over the memory of all her triumphs and achievements thereby she gathered encouragement for when had she proved inadequate to the moment what had occurred was harassing enough but hers was the habit the accumulated force of the victor she must take up that force now and shake off the sense of emergency and not dream of herself as baffled her superb health helped her already the cheerful blood coursed through her veins her eyes shone and her animal spirits were exhilarated she took back the sense of a power for conquest and the feeling of completeness within herself and her self-sufficiency broke from her in a spoken resolve whatever happens to me she said and what may not happen if this is going to happen whatever happens to me i resolve that i will never be beaten down wherever i am whatever i am i will live up to my present standard and will never fall below it i will not be poverty-stricken mean and small she drew her breath sharply and shut her mouth tightly afterwards her sense of individuality and her egoism included the need to produce striking effects the word poverty had an ugly sound her father had not glorified it to her she thought of a christian of the early church especially one of the fathers as an emaciated and probably uncleanly fanatic and she had no taste that way honora was a really gloriously healthy girl of the nineteenth century her two well-shaped feet were planted firmly on our mother earth and she had the tastes and orderly ideas naturally belonging to her sex her eyes dropping by chance wandered over her gown she was very well dressed in a becoming costume exceedingly well made i will not dress under my standard nothing shall ever reduce me to shabbiness said she with a quite passionate accent leslie will save me she added and the last words were uttered with conviction and a softened look she is not the first woman whose earliest softening towards a man has originated in the idea 
that he may save her from contact with unpleasant realities just then a slow laborious tread up the hill attracted her an old man was approaching a man with white hair and beard who helped his steps by a stick she glanced at him with no special interest but when he saw the dainty figure leaning against the wall he paused and looked at her with long leisurely admiration a fine day and a fine view said he yes it is beautiful said honora opening her mouth very prettily with a smile to utter the words showers o rain last neat and in the mornin sunshine he passed his hand with an almost loving movement along the landscape with eyes following the same direction it was a brown work-worn muscular hand and it lay tremulously against the distance as he still outstretched it the blue light showing between the fingers he had wonderful eyes their look was at once absent and penetrating the look of one who has been much alone with his own concentrated thought when they rested upon any special face it was almost impossible to avoid fancying that the piercing depth of their look was the outcome of personal scrutiny rather than an habitual characteristic they're lonesome said he in a quiet wistful tone very lonely said honora looking at the hills he indicated but grand grand enow but see he took up a position against the wall near to honora leaned a little towards her raised his stick and tremulously pointed to a particular slope of one of the hills opposite lonesome is it he asked again that dark steep bend of the hill where the coal pits have been it is very lonely she answered ay near the shaggy bit of a wood where to crows are settling now there well you'll maybe think it a bit lonesome lass to my old eyes it's full o folk there's always a stream o folk moiling up yon hillside or they're standing same as to crows now or more like huddled sheep together in the shadow of the woods why are they there he looked at her suddenly still pointing the stick honora drew back a little i don't know i don't understand said she they're there with faces and voices uplifted to heaven and they are crying together for mercy against the oppressor what do you mean said honora feeling a little alarmed in spite of the great age of the man i mind it he went on the same as though it were yesterday but i'm old two score a years and more i've been on this hillside and i was old when i came wife and children have passed from me forty and eight years have i wandered in this wilderness of the earth since i a mon over forty with hunger gnawing me body and soul climbed yon hill to listen and to pray we the rest i wife and children have passed but the voices are with me day and neat day and neat what voices said honora you're young you're young said the old fellow leniently or you'd mind me see lass this body o mine has felt starvation and these eyes has seen it and these ears ha heard the cry aunt and the like o that one forgets never folkses used to come there a neats the same as nicodemus came to his lord and they had torches in their hands and they spoke to the lord of their hunger and their trouble the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof yet some o his children starved while others waxed wanton so they spake to the lord in their trouble and he added in a voice slow and deep with conviction and he heard them honora was silent her heart began to beat ay he heard them repeated the man 
in a raised voice and with a sudden access of energy he judged the cause of the poor and the needy the spark kindled then is a flame still and naught can smother it who are you asked honora in a low voice the peasant turned his leisurely piercing look upon her piers norbury chartist and weaver i have woven many a cut and seen a queer bit o life in my time and i've tasted many a bitter drop folkses wouldna have took it so ill could they have hanged me in my youth i have had a price set on my head piers norbury repeated honora pale and startled piers looked at her with the same lenient leisurely look as before but the piercing light of his eyes had softened before her brilliant womanhood so they call me said he but you yosel will be no stranger here lass no said honora i am miss kemble the rector's daughter a good mon yon a good mon better than likely and i mind you ever since you were a little lass indeed said honora every vein running hot with indignation he looked at her now with a very evident personal scrutiny it's in my mind he said that it might be a wonderful thing if the ministers o god and the women would waken out of sleep in one accord it's in my mind he repeated how once we hopen something from a lass a gradely young thing same as yosel set our hearts and hopes upon her what lass asked honora coldly why to queen victoria she was young then and we writ her i was a young mon myself we writ her a bit of an address addressed to the queen from the workmen's association they call in it she was just crowned to nation were half mad wid joy i couldn't but think it would a uh, ha touched her we younger chaps thought a deal of a lass coming to rule over us lasses by all that's said are tenderer in their hearts than men happen it may be so but naught come of that address that i ever heard tell on maybe we were too far off and her mind lasses i reckon are giddy things at times her mind was just taken up wi' her crown and her fine sceptre and her throne maybe it'll be the same wi' other lasses still maybe they don't think they don't see honora's gloved hand clenched itself in angry silence this man who has influenced my father thought she is an ignorant fellow and it burned with shame in her heart that it should be so love it it was continued norbury that writ to main part of that address a fine mon was love it a fine mon now i never knew love it my son no but many a time have i longed to look in his eyes and grasp his hand and listen to his words you'll mind love it no said honora shortly she was in effect deplorably ignorant of the history of her own century but she took it for granted that the man referred to was insignificant and disreputable well he's dead and gone now likely before you were born i thought you'd maybe have read of him ay he's dead and he saw the end of his faith and hope no more than moses did it's still to come it's still to come his eyes flashed and widened with some overwhelming idea in the force of an indomitable faith his whole face strengthened and was lifted out of its age she was conscious that he was pausing for her reply her sympathetic concession of course in his mind she was simply her father's daughter but a suffocating anger was all the feeling of her heart and her lips remained rigidly closed this silence was an act of courage for she was a little frightened of the man otherwise she would have walked away well said he turning away from her irresponsive face to look again at the landscape 
eighty and eight years have i wandered in this wilderness of a world and hope and waiting have comforted me thy rod and thy staff eighty and eight years have i waited for i knew want and blows and hard work when i was a little toddlin thing of four i was four when the burden of work first became heavy and i first cried out and found none to answer i'm asking still not for myself my foot's in the grave and expectation died long ago but for them that now carry hunger in mind and body i've waited and i'm waiting still he raised his hand and took off his cap and stood motionless the fine rugged face with the memorable and prophetic eyes turned still upon the hills he had forgotten honora and she had no inclination to remind him of her presence she remained silent the light of indignation in her eyes and the colour of it in her cheek presently he replaced his hat took his stick again and made preparations to move on as he did so he directed one more glance of piercing scrutiny towards her ay he said i'm waiting still till the man arises or the woman comes to the throne that will fulfil the promise of the lord to his people sorrow and sighing shall flee away End of chapter three chapter four of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter four a couple of evenings later honora awaited the arrival of leslie littleton in the drawing-room she had done her best by a little rearrangement of the furniture and by the adornment of flowers to bring her surroundings something nearer her ideal as for herself reflecting that mr littleton was a london man she determined not to fall behind metropolitan taste and therefore put on a very exquisite but costly dress when she was ready her mirror assured her that the general effect was excellent and as she sat in the drawing-room in the evening sunlight she made a bright and graceful if somewhat glittering picture her father remained in his study he came into the drawing-room once glanced wistfully at the self-possessed figure by the window and deprecatingly at the altered furniture and then he went away again the renewed evidences of honora's attitude made him shrink during these two days though nothing had been said a hundred indications had forced upon honora a conviction of the finality of her father's decision and in face of it her courage and self-sufficiency were melting away as for the rector he was realizing vividly the extent of the disappointment she was enduring and he was measuring by that the immensity of the distance between them honora presently heard mr littleton arrive and then her father's voice in the hall she half rose from her seat and sat down again mr littleton as the deliverer was mr littleton in a new light he will take some little time to dress said she staring hard at the door in this she was deceived in a very few minutes mr littleton's step was heard descending the stairs and he entered the drawing-room closely followed by her father honora rose with a soft rustle of her garments and a bright opening of her eyes he had always been her instructor and he was now her saviour at the same time she could not restrain the flashing reflection that he was appearing before her in a rough tweed morning coat mr littleton was about her own height but being broad-shouldered and muscular he appeared taller than he was 
he had rather a rugged square-set face ornamented by a closely cut beard his short dark brown hair had a wave in it and he had a pair of exceedingly quiet brown eyes over which a strong square forehead with marked eyebrows very much projected it is a long time since we met said the young man looking at her with kindly reminiscent eyes yes said honora with an eager glance of expectation ah since that time a great hope has been fulfilled said he recognizing what was uppermost in her mind you were kind enough to write and congratulate my father i've no doubt he is very proud of you said leslie turning towards the rector through all these commonplace words flashed honora's hidden feelings if you only knew oh if you only knew she was saying to him with eyes and undertones soon you will know for i shall tell you the thought that he was to be the chosen recipient of her confidence endowed him with a reflection from her own self-esteem that is sometimes the beginning of love honora looked very handsome during dinner her eyes shone with repressed excitement and one cheek was a deeper red than the other the rector attended to his guest with fine old-fashioned hospitality his ease and the fact that the dinner turned out well and the consciousness of looking queenly in her handsome dress gave to honora a delicious sense of savoir vivre the present moment was as the first instalment of that circle with which she had intended to surround herself mr littleton was talking brilliantly and her father was no bad match they spoke of politics and mundane affairs of course but the rector touched them with a kind of astonishing and angelic insight as of one who has studied them upon the mount littleton looked at him again and again all this might and ought to be only the beginning of more said honora to herself losing for the moment the thread of the discourse but i wish we could have arranged to have the carving done on the sideboard father is forgetting what he is about the rector for the moment was standing over the saddle of mutton with suspended knife and fork while the servant waited patiently by his side his face was turned with animation towards littleton and an expression ominous to honora had come into his eyes littleton had said something about society viewed as an organism the rector was taking up the subject in his own way as a churchman littleton said he i prefer to think of society of all human life as a great sacramental system st clement you are aware conceives of the eucharistic celebrations of the church as a symbol of an all-pervading sacramental service i am not familiar with the old fathers mr kemble returned leslie gently smiling but that is something of goethe's idea indeed indeed returned the rector eagerly on my part i am ignorant of german literature it is true that in my youth i devoted a portion of my time to a study of german theology which you are aware has many peculiar and interesting features i own to having found a particular attraction in the writings of schleiermacher who freed himself in his more advanced thinking from the rationalistic tendency of the german school but otherwise my range in german has been limited i assure you littleton you interest me oh yes said littleton he expresses the opinion that the protestant worship has too few sacraments and it is in the same connection that he speaks of the great universal sacrament broken as it were into many others i might trouble you littleton perhaps to find me that passage your young culture invigorates and assists me now st ignatius father you are keeping mr littleton waiting at the interruption the rector dropped the fork from its exalted position and plunging it into the joint set it to humbler uses 
so i am my dear so i am said he meekly and darting a deprecating glance her way i am i fear too apt to preach in season and out of season he sighed and the carving proceeded in momentary silence it was at this instant that a thought which had been uneasily troubling littleton's mind took definite shape he glanced across at honora who was handling the stem of her wine-glass and looking down with a faint conscious smile what has she got those fine lady airs for and why does she wear that costly dress when the wine and fruit were on the table honora rose and after bestowing upon leslie a very friendly smile in which he was touched to detect something a little wistful left the room upon a kindly hint from his host he too rose and followed her he found her standing by the open veranda window in the now soft light of departing day he saw behind her the mossy green slope of the lawn the dark flat foliage of the cedar and beneath it an inviting gravel path that led on to a rose and flower garden beyond was a faintly coloured sky and hilly horizon she had thrown a wrap about her throat and shoulders and stood with one hand touching the woodwork and her head turned back towards him with the same expectant wistful look he had remarked before in fact her heart beat with hope and suspense and leslie advanced quickly with softened eyes you were going into the garden said he they went out side by side and passed under the shade of the old cedar on towards the rose bushes both had the consciousness of youth in common that sweet equality at starting out of which any delightful possibilities may arise in leslie's heart at least hovered a scarcely perceptible surmise well said he eager to shake some preliminary speech out of this thrilling silence i had a plan of work about which i should like to consult you she returned quickly work he started slightly and assumed the didactic manner peculiar to cambridge that is well i thought i ought to continue my greek studies and that i might do something original upon that line there are plenty of openings plenty of subjects that have not yet been touched her voice was hurried yes said littleton in a particularly quiet tone i am sure there is a career before me mr littleton i can't be content without a career i am ambitious to be a writer a slight flush rose to her cheek but subdued tears hung behind her lashes she was making this important confidence through the bitter feeling of defeat at the very outset you will perhaps she continued with a pretty shy air think it a very bold and vain ambition oh no said he i am only a little dubious about it do you propose to earn your living that way earn my living cried honora somewhat disdainfully i wish to perfect myself in greek culture and to prove it by writing a striking book i should like to examine the greek myths and to write upon them for instance there is ares and aphrodite a myth in the controversial stage i feel that these out-of-the-way things attract me yes yes said littleton with a pause between the monosyllables i am glad continued honora in a tone lowered by the remembrance of her secret trouble to have met you so to speak on the very threshold of my new life i remember my debt in the past indeed i do it was you mr littleton who first awakened in me a worthy ambition i said littleton with rather an embarrassed air yes yes it was you said the girl softly and unconsciously eager to flatter the man who was to save her from her difficulty what is this worthy ambition to which i helped you honora asked leslie you first awakened my intellect showed me that i had one in fact yes and best of all you made me conscious of myself i was sunk in conventionality 
you disturbed me made me live made me human and to what end asked leslie in an exceedingly low voice the end of it is said honora brightly that i am going to write a book she shook off the depressing consciousness of trouble with vigorous disdain leslie emitted a faint sigh don't discourage me murmured the girl pressing an inch nearer in a coaxing way i know it sounds ambitious but indeed i think i can do it i dare say you can returned leslie gently and mr lyttleton i do need some one to confide in my father he has been so good and kind but my father hardly understands me he has been going one way and i another i despair of making him understand me have you tried what is the use of trying one generation never understands the other and the old never understands the new her voice here fell to a tone so forlorn that leslie looked at her in surprise there was even a suggestion of tears scornfully controlled what is it he said men don't know she replied what it is to be utterly dependent on another's caprice and humour perhaps you have not explained yourself to your father how can i do that returned honora in a louder sharper voice it is impossible to explain to him the fresh growing ideas i brought from cambridge it would be trying to patch new cloth on old garments i don't feel so sure of that said leslie it would said honora with almost passionate emphasis there is a gulf between us must i explain for instance that his christ and his church are nothing to me well hardly that perhaps how am i to act i feel so young he is growing very old that is the natural course between two generations you can't expect to be an exception but all his ideas are old old now i am conscious of being in the foremost ranks of time littleton laughed softly i am just a little doubtful about the accuracy of your observation said he advanced thought does not always follow a chronological order but we are most likely to find it in the young true returned leslie in the young we have the resurrection and the life and i said honora cheered have been to the university while there i kept my mind open to every newest thing if i had not time to study it at least i dipped into everything that came before me y y yes said lyttleton in the very slowest manner of one whose manner was always slow like your favourite athenians honora paused drawing a quick little breath then she gathered a red rosebud and fastened it in the bosom of her dress she was trembling on the verge of her story and some vague instinct plucked at her skirts as though warning her of a fatal conclusion she shook off the eerie hand and plunged have you noticed anything unusual in my father she asked i have certainly noticed something unusual this admission gave her heart and walking by his side along the pleasant garden paths the soft aromatic airs of summer about them and the glories of evening and sunset around the great drama of a struggling human soul ran through her young lips in fluent phrases unillumined by the faintest comprehension and unsoftened by one touch of sympathetic emotion but personal feeling gave force to this bare recital and every now and then she reproduced her father's words with accuracy occasionally the immense sense of undeserved misfortune barbed a phrase with indignation mr lyttleton was an absolutely silent auditor she spoke the whole narrative rapidly with her face rather turned from than towards him and having her eyes fixed on vacancy and now said she bringing her story to a close help me tell me what i must do there was no immediate response honora paused in her walk in involuntary surprise leslie took one step in advance and then stopped also he was looking onwards to the hills with eyes that did not see them and the precise expression which he wore was new to honora and puzzled her so did his words when he spoke 
has this happened he cried you are interested asked she blindly feeling that an emotion seethed about her in which she was not concerned the look in leslie's face was as though a wind had blown against it deeply deeply he returned with emphasis i think perhaps faltered honora at least i hope that he only needs some one like you to reason with him to reason repeated leslie with the same absent and absorbed air i think she continued that it is all born of lonely brooding perhaps yes there have been things like this done before in the history of the world and sometimes they came out of lonely brooding yes yes honora a sigh tore his breast it was like the sigh of a great and satisfied passion another has done it he murmured honora's eyes were blank with surprise what is it what will you do she asked him what shall i do ah that is the right question for the first time in my life i feel as though theories were goads and conviction a spur have i ever believed before now i must act he turned his face towards her the strong and guarded reticence was gone the features were expanded by feeling why you have shaken me freed me he cried it was because i was sick with doubt that i could get no further this is a breeze that cures me you said you would act repeated honora dubiously mr littleton in his absorption took a stride and measured the garden path with his length of leg he had thrust his hands in his pockets and somehow his old comfortable boots and tweed coat intruded themselves upon honora and pointed the vexation his incomprehensible behaviour was beginning to arouse moreover he had the misfortune to turn his shoulder away from her it was so evidently the act of preoccupation that honora's sense of sex was offended i came to you she said dryly to help me in an intolerable misfortune that threatens myself littleton turned round again with awkward suddenness oh i don't know that i should call it a misfortune it is undoubtedly a change a wave of self-pity overwhelmed her and for the moment checked her utterance she gazed at him through a mist finding him suddenly very much rougher and uglier than she had thought he was looking down on the gravel path thoughtfully and fingering his beard in the manner of a man perplexed for speech meanwhile the sun had set and heavy shades began to surround them honora was glad of the obscurity i feel it to be a misfortune which my father is bringing upon me of his own free will said she when she could speak well i see it might strike you in that way i find the life i had chosen is put an end to what is your chosen life asked leslie slowly the life of culture said honora just a little grandly well said leslie somewhat impatiently what is to hinder honora felt perplexed both by his tone and the words besides his question had posed her and she disliked being posed to start with said she in a low voice i find myself homeless do you want a home asked littleton honora thought of the circle and all her pleasant plans with the rectory furniture and felt that she wanted a home very much indeed she explained a few of the intentions she had entertained it appears to me that you don't want a home said leslie when she had done but simply a place that you may revolutionize to suit some rather extravagant tastes of your own in exterior matters in his voice was a dry undertone but honora did not mind being accused of extravagant tastes that seemed to argue a rather rich individuality his want of sympathy was not however so pleasant don't you sympathize with me said she with a break in her voice yes 
yes when there's anything real that is by the way if you stopped in the rectory and began all this sort of thing wouldn't you make your father very uncomfortable i meant to be considerate to father said she leslie laughed honora thought him disagreeable there is a great difference between my father's mind and my own said she blushing in the dark yes honora a radical difference a difference in moral attitude honora felt startled mr littleton was implying blame to her and she felt herself to be not the subject for blame but for condolence i must seek my life differently from my father said she resolutely he is still sticking fast in the long dead notions of his youth from what you tell me i should say that his mind is moving perhaps too quickly for your comprehension this remark wounded her vanity in its most sensitive point she always pictured herself as skimming the cream of modern thought but mr littleton's remark by its very brusqueness argued a genuine observation honora hated brusqueness she hated the raw material and liked things offered to her civilized manufactured cooked she glanced towards him with a steely dislike in her eyes which he could have caught even in the gathering darkness had he been looking towards her i find he continued riding heedlessly on in the ways of offence this action of your father's the expression of a very fine originality indeed it is splendid he has reached the very newest and most ruthlessly revolutionary idea of the time through the simple directness of his conscience and the genuine vitality of his religious faith i hardly know what you are talking of said honora coldly i am afraid not returned leslie sadly we appear to be hitting one another in the dark you can hardly expect me said honora his choice of phrase offending her fastidious taste again to admire notions that plunge me into severe and undeserved misfortune you tell me you are to have the one hundred and fifty pounds which belong to your mother that appears to me to be a very generous arrangement i have higher ambitions she exclaimed and then she added suddenly with proud compunction of course i shall not take the one hundred and fifty pounds no said littleton inflicting a new wound by the facility with which he accepted the sacrifice of course not honora did not respond what had happened to her world that she found herself suddenly plunged into confusion she stared up to the darkening heavens where the stars one by one were appearing and found them smaller than usual all her horizons were contracting littleton waited through the eloquent silence with a troubled face i find myself in the first great difficulty of my life came the girl's trembling voice through the darkness at last and my old friend my old friend she faltered it appears i have humiliated myself by asking help where i shall not find it she added you have not humiliated yourself returned leslie in agony how can that be i want to help you you do can you doubt it it is always rash to put the final test but honora's first week at home had been a season of storms and she had a mind to fathom the extent of her disaster then if you wish to help me if you are still my friend she began in a shaking voice persuade my father to give up his intention no honora said leslie after a long painful silence flatly i cannot why asked she in a voice as cold as a raindrop because returned leslie with effort i sympathize with your father with all my heart and strength i would emulate such an act if i could i may add that it seems to have suddenly given me something i have long been in search of through the darkness honora saw him throw his head up with a significant movement had all the world gone mad together life seemed to be playing some dreadful trick upon her you sympathize with my father then you do not sympathize with me no honora said he plainly i do not 
she drew back from him and sought for the next step and then she knew there was no next step it is all such a riddle to me she murmured forlornly looking with desperate eyes into a darkened sky yes said leslie shortly and to me too she glanced at him furtively once again to see if there were signs of yielding and saw only a stern rugged profile bending towards the ground a feeling of speechless hatred crept into her heart let us go in said she End of chapter four chapter five of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter five when the two returned by way of the veranda into the drawing-room they found the rector awaiting them littleton caught a brief look of expectancy in the old face that made him vaguely uncomfortable it vanished the instant the two came well within the light honora took off her wrap and tossed it aside littleton began to hurry out commonplace talk to the rector but there was fitful absence of mind in all his remarks honora's face was blanched from its brilliancy and the bubbling over of exhilaration and defiance which leslie's presence had brought her the costly dress no longer became her she got some work a piece of art embroidery by which cultured ladies show their superiority over the common uses of the needle it made leslie feel more discontented with her than ever the rector looked from one gloomy face to the other where were the red colours of the lover's paradise the swift sweet arrows of the eye his old heart ran down and his hand shook his courtship of honora's mother had been a simple delicate idol of unbroken harmony meanwhile conversation was laboured and intermittent and as often as not partook of the nature of crooked questions and crooked answers honora was for the most part silent she was too openly at variance with both men to trouble herself about social deportment for the moment moreover her sense of desperate plight was very real she sat with cold proud demeanour and an agonising lump in her throat pushing the needle in and out and hearing not leslie's commonplace remarks of the moment but echoes from the brusque truths of the garden then too she regretted her handsome dress puerilities of the kind are often more disturbing than great misfortunes and it is in effect more wretched to be wretched in a gala dress than in a commonplace morning gown she hated herself for having put the costly thing on did mr littleton suspect that it was her best her very best she hid under her skirts the fine silk stocking and embroidered shoe and hoped that mr littleton with his conspicuous feet had not remarked them littleton broke in upon the rector's mournful patter of desultory remarks with an impatient sigh and while his tongue answered with more or less of appropriateness his mind told itself that any effort to explain his position or his views to honora would be vain because the planes on which their thoughts moved were different there is no point of contact between us as far as i can see thought he she is straining towards individualism and i am striving to leave it honora had no desire to prolong her share of the evening worn out by nights of broken rest and agitated as she was she made an early excuse to retire to bed this cold feminine withdrawal had an extinguishing effect on the masculine element the two men sat abashed listening to the gentle rustle of her garments along the passage and when that had died away they stole furtive glances towards each other leslie whose face was all made up to remorse felt that hanging was too merciful for him 
the rector who had been listening for the last sound leaned forward in his chair towards his guest has she told you littleton he began in a hasty whisper my dear young friend is the door shut leslie rose softly and trod cautiously along the room to ascertain smiling as he did so at the touch of human nature yes she has told me said he as soon as he had tried the handle and returned to the hearth the rector looked at him with an unspoken but not very hopeful question in his eyes littleton shook his head mr kemball said he she does not understand the rector sighed his face was grayer and older an old wound unadmitted even by himself and long cured ached afresh at one time he had vehemently desired and asked of the lord a son to train in holy orders leslie sat down by his side the the spiritual situation is too hard for her said he i have striven to shelter her as long as it was permitted me to do so and now i am as it were handing strong meat to a babe oh said leslie rather briskly do not fear for your daughter it seems a little rough on her at first but i am quite sure she is equal to any event that may occur will carry herself well out of it his tone was a little hard capacity for failure as well as success is on occasion found to be a grace i trust that this has been no cause of offence between you said the rector hurriedly leslie fingered his beard nervously i am said he a little out of her good graces i must confess i am afraid perhaps i was too emphatic and brusque i have expressed myself mr kemble as almost passionately in sympathy with you and mind wrestles with mind returned the other yet i have had experience in her mother of the deep capacity of the female for spiritual things of an elevation of nature and insight beyond our coarser fibre i think of an angelic hand leading in constant amity my soul to higher things non sadis eloquor quid eroja me habebat animi an involuntary sigh from leslie was the only response to the rector's murmured words your sympathy and approval littleton i take as god's unlooked-for gift to me i heartily thank you for it the way is not dark it is clear and full of heavenly consolation but the human heart leaps towards human sympathy as well and he bowed his reverend head meekly towards the young man meanwhile honora had undressed and thrown herself upon her bed and then she cried helplessly and furiously they were the first bitter tears of self-pity she had ever known and they were very scalding and hateful to her moreover she was angry there was injury in her weeping a great frenchman has remarked that each individual carries with him more or less unconsciously a conception of his own bearing and appearance between the notion and the fact is often a disparity but there in the mind it lurks our own ideal of our person and deportment honora's unconscious picture of herself comprehended a drawing-room in which to move effectively there was always in imagination space about her and an opportunity for demeanour and now the drawing-room had gone and with it she seemed to lose sight of any recognisable self where am i where am i cried the poor girl wildly clutching the pillow with hands that for once were tremulous has it really got to happen so that i shall be nobody that i should be like everybody else that was the bitter drop to fastidious honora but she was no coward in her suffering she summoned all her pride to meet the situation and mingled some natural determination to produce a dramatic effect to startle the two traitors below with a genuine effort to see her way rightly out of the desperate fix in which she found herself 
now it is the commonest thing in the world for girton and newnham students upon leaving college immediately to apply for a situation it became evident to honora that this very ordinary course was precisely the one left open to her in spite of bitter anger and rebellion and in spite of the hot tears with which she bedewed her pillow during the night she had character enough to accept it resolutely one piece of consolation remained and this was not small she would by anticipating action and declaring her intention force leslie to respect and admire her and to boot make him and her father exceedingly uncomfortable by this direct evidence of the miserable straits to which they had reduced her honora's tears had their sweet commingling next morning's breakfast was an uneasy occasion littleton melted instantly before the traces which honora's sleepless night and weeping had left on her face he thought it unreasonable but he liked her infinitely better at this moment than he had at dinner last night and he ate his meal in deprecation and compunction he made haste to announce an early withdrawal of his presence honora who already before she came downstairs had slammed his likeness into a drawer and turned the key on it received the announcement with a marble face so soon she said politely raising an eyebrow the rector hastily passed him the toast after breakfast littleton was heard banging his portmanteau about in his room and was thought to be packing the sound brought a lump again to honora's throat but she got the better of it by administering a severe and untimely reproach to the housemaid which made the latter cry when littleton was heard coming downstairs she waylaid him but kept the same marble face which she had worn during breakfast littleton glanced at her guiltily and out of sheer excruciated feeling earned her additional disdain by thrusting his hands nervously into his pockets i thought you might care to know to what resolution i have come before you leave us said she littleton's eyes deepened into his kindest look i should care very much said he i ought to have said the resolution to which i have been forced added honora coldly i am going away yes thank you for telling me i am going to earn my own living littleton's face upon which she kept a watchful eye brightened and overflowed with some sort of feeling which she did not understand that is precisely the step which you ought to take honora said he with unfortunate directness it is the one i hoped for the one i felt sure you would choose it would be teaching of course at that moment honora hated him as she had never hated any human being before teaching of course she repeated bitterly well said the detestable young man warmly offering his hand apparently not seeing in the least why she should not be set down amongst the of courses i can only hope that great good may result to you and others from this resolution i hope it with all my heart you will i am sure let me hear what you finally decide indeed i shall be interested my old address will find me thank you said honora and littleton rather suddenly dropped the icy fingers grudgingly extended to him End of chapter five